Good evening, everybody. Um, we're going to spend most of our time on sensors tonight, but uh, we talked about the blue motor control blocks, but we didn't actually demonstrate them last time. So I'm going to do that first, uh, which means I need to do a share screen. Um, instead of featuring Spike Prime for uh, a few minutes, I'm going to feature the uh, EV3 classroom software. So here's the program I wrote an hour ago. Um, and I'm going to break it apart to keep it simpler. And then I'll make I'll put it back together again. Anytime a, a, a brick is not connected to an event, uh, in this case, the yellow event is when the program starts. Anything not connected to an event doesn't get, get executed. You can throw it away completely by tossing it off to the left. But if you want to reserve it to plug in and again, you can just disconnect it. So the program I have now is when uh, the program starts, set the A motor speed to 25% and uh, tell it, that motor to turn counterclockwise for 45 degrees. I'm going to grab a robot. Uh, in this case, the A motor is uh, the medium sized motor mounted kind of in front and the bottom is connected to these arms via a pair of strange looking gears right there that you can barely see, they're black. Um, and then if you follow the cable that comes out of the back of that motor, it goes around to port A right there on the front of the robot. And uh, let's see, the camera is not my friend right now, is it right there? So when I say set the A motor speed to 25%, I'm talking about that motor. And when I say to turn counterclockwise for 45 degrees, it should do that. Uh, this modified program is not in the robot, but I have previously established a Bluetooth connection. So I'm gonna download it by clicking on the down button in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. It made a weird noise indicating it received it. And uh, it's gonna hold it up in the air and show it wiggling this arm. So I have to select the program which requires squinting. Um, so, oh, it wasn't quite on camera. So let me force that arm up a little bit um, and do that again. So you can see the arm move down. So let's make the program more complicated by getting the B and C motors involved, which are driving these wheels. Uh, if you follow those motors around, they go to the B and C port here and here. So I'm telling the program that that's where they're connected, setting their speed to 25%. Then I have a sequence of magenta bricks Make those a little bigger for you, maybe by hitting the plus sign. Move straight for two rotations. That's not a number of inches, it's number of rotations of these wheels. So if I knew what the circumference of those wheels are, I could predict how far two uh, rotations would be, or vice versa. If I I could divide by the circumference, uh, the distance that I desired by the circumference, determine the number of rotations and it will allow fractional rotations. Um, then I'm gonna tell it to turn left, uh, a hard left um, for half a rotation. And then I'm gonna tell it to go straight for a half a rotation. And then I'm gonna tell it to uh, move its uh, arm up. So it's, we're gonna be kind of like a, uh, a, what do they call it? The loaders, I think is, is the name of a, a machine that goes out and, and loads sand into a, a truck or whatever, moves forward, puts its arms down. And we don't actually have a bucket on this robot, but we can pretend we do. Uh, but it could lift some, some other Lego mechanism up with these arms. Uh, so I'm gonna put that down on and switch cameras.
And if I stop share, I'll make that bigger on your screen probably. So you can see the robot is in the distance because the camera is opposite of me. The robot is right there. And let me check and see if it's still got the same program selected. Yeah. It's going to do that sequence when I hit this button. We put the arm down. Nope, didn't move forward. Is that a bug? Probably. Let's take a look. Oh, I didn't download the program. So again, the, the, uh, the software is always very literal. You can change the program, but if you don't put it in the robot, it's going to do the old version of the same program. So put that in the, uh, you can't see that because I'm not sharing the screen, but I did download it and here we go. Selected. Okay, third time's a charm. Makes that turn and then lifts the arm. Uh, so if I'm not happy with the mount, it lifted the arm. Let me uh, do a screen share again. and change the number of uh, rotations or the number of degrees to let's say 80 degrees and it should lift the arm up higher. Um, this time I'll try to remember to do the download then drop the screen share. Okay, so you can see that it raised the arm a bit more that time. So for those of you who were here uh, last night, you'll see the program looks very similar um, to the um, program we did for the Spike Prime, except we didn't have any blue blocks last time. Um, the, there are a few details, in particular, the magenta blocks for the EV3 don't give you the option of specifying the number of centimeters or inches, you've got, as we talked about last night, you have to calculate um, either on paper or in the program, the number of rotations or degrees you want uh, to go a particular distance. Well, Spike Prime does that math for the kids, making it a bit easier. See, I've got a note from Colette here. Uh, could you please show how to arrange your motors on the, uh, on the EV3? Uh, how, how I arranged Yeah, Bruce, I just was curious, just based on how your robot was functioning, where you put your three motors. Okay, let's see if I can do that with the camera that we're on now. This is a, a standard design uh, where these large motors are mounted on the chassis down here and they stick out. Um, and there's an axle here, and you can put the wheel on that. Can you bring it down just a little bit, Bruce? We can't see it. Just uh, a little bit closer to the, there you go. So there's, there's a large motor on the left side and a large motor on the right side um, with the wheels on it. That's how, how the uh, drive motors are mounted on the CV3. And then the uh, medium-sized motor is mounted on the chassis in the front and it controls this arm via these gears. People see that almost on the screen there? Yep. Okay. Yes, thank you, Bruce. You're welcome. Okay, so uh, that's not a complete uh, demonstration of uh, using blue blocks, but Let's dive into sensors for a while and see, see how far we get with sensors. We can always come back to movement and uh, motor blocks if we have time. 
So let's go to some slides. Let's stop that share. No, I'm not sharing right now. So we'll go to um, So I'll put Javier on the spot. Javier, do you, do you see a slide that says sensing the world? Very good. I do. Thank you. Um, so the, uh, a pretty good metaphor for what sensors do on robots is they're the eyes, ears. I, I don't know of a Lego robot that, that can uh, smell. So I guess it's not the nose. Um, but the gyro is a bit like your inner ear. Uh, if you if you're sitting in a uh, a office chair that uh, goes back and forth like the one I'm in, um, let me actually switch to my other camera. So I think you can see I can rotate in my chair. If I close my eyes and a family member came in and rotated my chair, I could probably still tell that I've been rotating because my inner ear pro provides a bit of a gyro effect. Um, some gyros will only give you that rotation. Uh, the gyro in uh, the Spike Prime, built into the Spike Prime Pub, also gives you pitch and what would be roll this way. Um, and those pitch roll and yaw are terms particularly appropriate to aviation when an airplane is pitching up uh, or yawing left or right, um, et cetera. Uh, you will sometimes hear those same terms used in boating. Um, and they're common when you're talking about gyros and robots. In the first Lego League world, uh, the Axis that's important is the yaw axis uh, because it allows you to control left and right turns. So if you see uh, pitch or uh, roll on the screen, there's only a slight chance that's what the kids wanted. Um, they need almost always to choose yaw when there is a choice to get uh, the gyro the, the way they want it. You can also think of some of the hub buttons as being sensors and that uh, there are ways of, of having the program change what it does based on which button is pushed, and we may touch on that a bit, um, no pun intended. Um, but in the first Lego world, keep in mind that the kids are only uh, allowed to touch the robot when it's in home base. If they touch it out of home base, they lose bonus points. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to talk about blocks that uh, do control. I foreshadowed those last night when I said that you can have loops and you can have if and else's. We won't get into those tonight. Uh, in order to demonstrate sensors, we're going to use what are called event blocks. And those are kind of convenient, but you'll see my programming style once we introduce control blocks will uh, tend to use the sensors with control blocks rather than with event blocks. There are some times when you do want to use event blocks but that's fairly advanced. Uh, tonight, it just happens to be convenient because we haven't even told you what a control block is yet. So here's an, a, an event block that says, if the color sensor that's connected to A detects red, then do some other blocks. Um, and if I click on that, uh, we can see with the EV3, we get that same power, but um, the sensors are connected to numbered ports, so you have to tell it which number they, that uh, color sensor is connected to. And then you select, instead of from a colorful palette, you select from the uh, list of words. So it's just a bit stylistic differences there and differences in the way the robots are mechanically put together that have influences the difference in those blocks. Um, you can also ask the robot for what percentage of light the color sensor is detected. And if I turn on my Spike Prime robot, um, in a moment, it's gonna turn on two LED lights uh, that surround. You can't quite see their circles, but there's a circular LED light on each of these and the actual sensor's in the middle. And that allows it to get enough light to tell which color is uh, in front of it. Uh, if I hold it up against 
the black bezel of my uh, laptop, it'll detect black. And if I hold it up against a white sheet of paper, it'll detect white and, and likewise for some primary colors. But it's often useful to talk about percentage of light rather than distinguishing between black and white, how about shades of gray? And how about shades of blue that they might be similar in the amount of reflected light. So it gives you that option. You can say, uh, please give, uh, tell me when the color sensor connected to A is detecting reflected light that's less than 50%. And that's really useful for line following and detecting a turn in a line. And we'll, we'll try to demonstrate that yet tonight. Um, then there's uh, the, uh, you can also ask it the, for the number. Here, we're actually doing a comparison all in one block, but sometimes you may want to do a calculation with a number. So you, uh, this oval block will give you a number from zero to 100, while this trapezoid block will give you a true or false. And that'll make more sense when we get into math and into control blocks. But we're talking about sensors tonight, and uh, those are the light blue blocks. So that's what you see here. With uh, the EV3 robot, the differences are, are partly where you connect. You can, you can connect um, the color sensor to ports one, two, three, or four on the front of the robot. Um, and then you make a similar comparison or uh, you can get back the value of the reflected light. So very equivalent blocks, just the difference in the, in the way you plug things in on the robot. So questions about the color sensor uh, from what I've said so far? Uh, oh, I've got a question from Melody. Uh, during a Lego competition, will the lights affect the reflected light pro uh, programming? Yes, but uh, the kids may be able to control that by uh, keeping the light sensor fairly close to the mat. So there's not much opportunity for ambient light to reflect off the mat into the sensor. They might even design bricks that go around the sensor to, to further shield from ambient light. Um, and so they can control that. But I've seen kids ask the referee before the competition starts if they can go do some light, uh, light sensor testing in the gymnasium. And then they go back to the pit and make the final adjustment to the robot based on what they learned about the, uh, the sensitivity of these sensors in the actual competition. Um, I don't know if all referees or tournament directors will allow that, but I've, I've seen them say yes to that. But again, there's ways of, of making it less sensitive to that. I, I had a really quick question too about uh, just the differences for light intensity. Would that be a case where you might wanna use a variable and in multiple places, uh, I noticed that um, the option of variables exists. Is that something that you could define, reuse, and then if you sit, if you're in like say a new location like a competition, you could change the light intensity, and then that would kind of take a effect in multiple places. Yeah, you're getting into a, a good idea. Um, it's a bit advanced until we get into that part of the programming, but I have to answer the question now. Um, one approach that would, I, I think, in, in incorporate your good idea is if you had a variable that was your threshold and um, in uh, where the kids are practicing at home or in a classroom, they might decide that the threshold is 60%. If it's less than 60%, they do one thing. If it's greater than 60%, they do something else. They put that, rather than hard coding the 60% in the program, they might put it in a variable <coughs> called T for threshold, maybe, or threshold uh, spelled out. And then uh, they do the comparison uh, against that variable. Uh, at the competition, they would then just have to change the value in that variable uh, to some other threshold, and perhaps the program would work just as well. Uh, if I go back one slide, I can answer another question I got in chat. Um, Let's see. Nope, sorry, going the wrong direction. Here we go. The, the brick for getting the number of, uh, for reflected light and spike run at the bottom of this slide. Um, 
And if I click again, it'll switch to the EV3, which looks very similar, except it's longer and skinnier and has a number for the port instead of a letter um, and has, has uh, more words. So those are the equivalent oval um, software bricks that return a number. Um, when you see me using the color sensor, I'm, I'm usually using a fairly simple way and it's more likely that I'll use the trapezoid to make a decision, um, but we can get into other examples, time permitting. Um, another sensor is the touch or the pressure sensor. Uh, the, uh, let's see if I have to go grab my kit, but it's basically uh, a, a Lego, a little Lego brick that has a button on it. And in the uh, newer Spike Prime, uh, it can be pressed, hard pressed or released, um, or you can actually uh, ask for a, a value and it'll give, give you how hard it's pressed. Um, actually, that's on the later slide in Newtons. But uh, in the EV3, it doesn't return at Newtons. And um, so you see uh, the values here where you have an event. If for Spike Prime, you'd say, is the pressure sensor connected A pressed? If it is, you're going to do the, uh, the blocks um, connected to, the, to uh, that event block. The equivalent block in EV3 classroom would be uh, when the touch sensor is pressed. So those are very equivalent because neither is based on uh, Newtons. Um, another sensor is uh, the distance or ultrasonic sensor. Uh, in both kits, there it is an ultrasonic sensor. It sends out ultrasonic sound and then measures how much of that sound comes back and how, how uh, what's the delay in it uh, bouncing back. Um, in the EB3 kit, they talk of, uh, about it uh, by how it works and they call it the ultrasonic sensor. In the Spike Prime, they talk about what it does and they call it the distance sensor. They're very, very similar sensors. Um, in the computation field, there's our two, two by four walls around the four foot by eight foot table. Those can be used for range sensing to, to fi find the edge of the competition field. Um, they will tend to be pretty accurate if the robot is pointing directly at the wall. If it's obliquely pointing at the wall, if the wall's here and it's pointing in this direction, a lot of that sound's gonna bounce off. Uh, the angle of incidence becomes the angle of reflection and not much of the sound comes back. If the robot is out here pointing directly at the wall, it's gonna get a pretty accurate reading of the distance to the wall. I, I don't spend a lot of time personally in using that sensor, but uh, I've seen some pretty good results. Um, Melody asked whether that's like uh, echolocation for bats. Yes, very, very similar. Um, it's amazing that the bat can do uh, something that requires the computer for humans to do. Um, you can also uh, make decisions. Uh, here's an event that says if, if the uh, distance sensor connected to A is closer than eight. Let's see, I've got that covered up by so I know by eight percent. I'm not even sure what that means. I'd have to look it up. I would tend to choose either centimeters or inches. So um, is it cl uh, closer than eight centimeters? Uh, or eight inches, or you can change that to some other number uh, to make uh, a set of blocks uh, trigger when that uh, event becomes true. Um, with the uh, EV3, it's very similar, uh, but that uses some words. Uh, distance is less than, and um, you have four options based on, uh, on comparing centimeters and inches. So here's some examples of these events. The first stack of blocks is executed unconditionally when the program starts, when, when the human pushes that round button on the spy prime. Um, and then the, the program quits doing things and it waits for this event, which is the color sensor to um, detect red. Well, when is that gonna happen? Well, the last thing 
that the program told the robot to do was start moving. So the robot's gonna just keep moving and keep moving until this event occurs, uh, in, which is detecting a red stripe, and then it'll stop moving and then uh, change the speed and then turn right um, and change the speed again and then move straight. All occurs after it's found something red on the playing field. Um, the spike prime also has um, uh, kind of almost invisible buttons next to the circle button, uh, white on white, there's a left button and a right button. Um, you can uh, make it do things based on pushing those buttons. But again, you, you can't do that when the robot's moving around the playing field, um, but it, that might be useful in selecting a, a particular feature of a program the kids have written before they send it off. Here's the equivalent for EB3. So in uh, both robots, the sensors are connected to ports. Um, in Spike Prime, they can be uh, connected to any of the six ports. And if you follow these two color sensors around, um, I've got one of them connected to, to A and one connected to B with the motors connected, to, uh, the, the wheel motors connected to C and D and the front motor connected uh, to E. So in this sample on the screen, we're saying uh, when the color sensor connected to A, which would be this one, uh, sees red. Uh, the slide also makes the point that you wanna keep the cables tight so they don't snag things on the playing field. And you can see I've done that here on this robot. And here's the equivalent for uh, EV3 classroom using EV3, where we've selected um, one of the four sensor ports on the front of the robot. So to summarize, in addition to those event blocks, you can uh, make get yes, no answers from the trapezoidal blocks, and uh, you can get uh, value uh, numbers uh, from some of the sensors, you can see that uh, you're getting a color back, you're getting a, a percentage of uh, light, you're getting a pressure value back, you're getting a distance ba value back, et cetera. Um, so I'm really tossing out a whole bunch of bricks that we won't uh, cover all of these tonight, but now you know what the palette is of lots of choices for, for sensors, for, for uh, events, values, and yes, no values, true, false values. Uh, here are some other ones that you can use in calculations. Now let's talk about the gyroscope. I said that yaw is the key one. So on the spike prime, you can get bad, back a yaw angle, and that'll be between uh, zero and uh, 360 degrees. We'll demonstrate that in a minute. Um, the uh, EV3 only has yaw, so they just call it angle. Um, that is fine unless you happen to need uh, pitch or roll. But the kids tell me that they have trouble with the EV3 uh, gyro uh, drifting and that uh, sometimes it'll change its number even if the robot isn't turning. Um, I, I'm not absolutely sure that's true of the current EV3, but it, um, I, uh, Anecdotally, it's more challenging to get the yaw value to be reliable on the EV3 than the spike prime. So when I send you a copy of the PDF, you'll get uh, some optional homework assignments that uh, you can do tonight, tomorrow, uh, or later in the week, or, or some other time. These are really mostly for you, but you could consider uh, having the kids do some of this as well when you get them together. So how are we doing on time here? Giving you a whole bunch of stuff, uh, pretty fast forward. Uh, in a minute, I'm gonna start doing some, some demos, but let me slow way down and say of all these bricks, um, 
what questions you have. Let's see. Colette has a question in chat. I'm assuming for light sensors, it's more accurate if you use light intensity versus uh, if it reads black. It depends on what you're doing. If you're trying to follow a black road, in my experience, absolutely yes. Use the light intensity. You can follow that edge um, and you can get pretty close to staying on the edge by figuring out what threshold you want to use. Um, on the other hand, if the playing field has got red and blue stripes um, and, and brown stripes and black stripes, using a re reflected light percent, uh, percentage to go out until it gets to the red stripe, it's going to be pretty tough. So you're probably better off taking advantage of the fact it's a color sensor and going out and looking for the particular color. Uh, the one caveat is that the palette is not all the colors in a uh, uh, 100 uh, uh, crayon box. It's, it's more the primary colors uh, and maybe a couple of others. And those might be typical of Lego brick, bricks that uh, some Lego bricks are pretty close to primary colors. And they might be typical of, of this season's first Lego League mat. But the kids are going to need to do some experimenting to see if, if they're looking for blue, is the blue that the robot uh, detects uh, the same as the blue on, on the map? Are there questions about any of these sensors? Uh, my chat box is small. I'll, I'll make it bigger in case there are other questions here. Uh, Apparently there was a dialogue between Jane and Chris about displaying. Um, the good news about EV3 is you can display lots of stuff on its fairly sophisticated LCD screen. The challenge is being able to see it um, in uh, from a distance because it's pretty tiny on a, <coughs> a low uh, contrast LCD screen. The good news on the uh, Spike Prime is when it's on, it can display a number pretty big on this screen, uh, but pretty much only one or two digits at a time. And so if you've got a word, it's gonna scroll the word across, but it'll be big enough to see from a distance. So there's a bit of an engineering trade-off there. Other questions about sensors? Okay, so let me stop this share and I'm gonna switch to Spike Prime. This is the program we worked on last night. Um, I'm going to move some of these blocks off to the side. And replace this one with a start moving block. And then I'm going to put an event block. Let's see. Let's use this one and change the color to black. So let's read these two programs. When the program starts, set the movement speed of the wheel motors to 25%. Assume that those motors are connected to C and D. And you need to share. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Sharing. I'm just going to ask you. Thanks for keeping me straight. No problem. Let's get that shared so you can see what the heck I'm talking about. All right. Let me slow down here and re-explain. I, I took last night's program and divided it into two sections. When the program starts, um, set the movement speed to 25%. Set the movement motors to C and D. Uh, tell the program to assume the circumference of the wheels is 17 and a half centimeters uh, and then start moving, but I don't want to start moving right. I'm going to tell it to move straight ahead. 
and it'll move at 25% speed until something else happens. Then I have this event that says when the A sensor, which is this light sensor uh, connected to port A detects black, uh, turn right and move for nine centimeters uh, or make a right turn for nine centimeters, that'd be turning in place, move straight for 63 centimeters, uh, turn left, for uh, nine centimeters, go forward, et cetera, et cetera. So let's see if this program actually decides to make the turn when it sees black. So let's download that into slot number two. Ah, we're not connected. Need to set up the Bluetooth here. Connect. New hub. Connect. It beeped, so now we are connected. I can X out of this. It says it was successfully connected. Now I can download. Making it, you can see these little dots in the lower right hand corner. That's downloaded into slot number two. So I'm going to switch to two. And I'm going to switch cameras. I'm going to drop to share. Get rid of one robot. I put it here. Let's see, we're going to put it here so it detects this black there. Okay, so it kind of did what I told it to do, but not exactly what I wanted it to do. So let's take a look at our program. So I'm adding a block. I separated this out to give myself room. Um, and I go over here and I get another move straight. And I'm gonna tell it to go, let's measure that. going to be about three more centimeters that I'm going to walk. So I'm going to change to 10 to three. But actually, I want the wheels to be, so I measured that wrong. I want the axle of the wheels to be in the center. That's more like 10 centimeters. So 10, was, the default happened to be about right. So I'm going to make that 10. And then replug this in. And to simplify, I'm going to unplug those three so the program stops a little sooner. So again, it's going to start out moving um, and it'll keep going until it finds black. Then it'll move another 10 centimeters forward and then turn right and then go downfield for 63 centimeters. Now I need to download that. and tell it to go. Now, I'm not still not happy because in order to get it to behave, I had to put the robot here so that let this sensor detected the turn. Why don't we use the B sensor 
which is on the right side. So they can be line up, start out lining up with this and this sensor will detect the road and then it'll make its turn. So a simple change I can make to the robot is to change A to B right here. And then re-download it. And to make that bigger on the screen, I'm going to drop the share. Pretty close to the center of the road. Running downfield and stops there. So how are we doing here? Let's try one more modification and do the share again. I'm going to hook these back up so it can complete its run. And what else would be fun to do? I can change this run to start moving. And then I can add another event. where we do, I'm gonna check the A sensor for the left turn of the road, change this to black. And then tell it to turn left when it gets to the second turn road. So this, this will trigger when it, the right sensor detects the right turn in the road, and then it'll start moving down that road. This will trigger when the left sensor detects the left turn in the road, but I've got this same flaw here. I need to have it go a little bit farther once it detects. It. So I'm going to duplicate this book brick. I right clicked on it to get another copy of it, tossed out the things I don't need. Doing this a little too fast, but this shows how flexible this language is. And now I download all of this and see what if it gets anywhere close to working. And I'm going to stop the share. Now, the problem is that it didn't stay centered on the road. So detect the left sensor detect the black early. So what can we do about that? We can uh, add um, line following, but that's going to require control blocks, um, which we don't get to till tomorrow night. So we're gonna we're gonna find something else to do in, in a minute. But before we do that, let me put the program back on the screen. Am I losing you? We go. No, I see. It. I see it now. Yep. Yeah. When the program starts, it it sets things up and goes straight. When it takes text black the first time, it goes a little bit farther, turns right. When it takes black the second time, it goes a little farther and then turns left. Um, so I'm going to stop to share and demonstrate that program one more time. The point that I didn't make before. is if the kids had a way to precisely set this robot in exactly the same position every time, maybe it didn't need that sensor. But the advantage of the sensor is they can start the robot here and it'll detect the turn of the road just as well as if it started there. So I don't know if you can see that with webcam there. So even though it was farther away, uh, it waited until it found black to make its turn.
So back to screen sharing. Sorry that Zoom gets me befuddled on occasion. So let's pick a different sensor. Let's do the gyro sensor. Oh, Melody asked whether uh, if you're using EV3s, uh, what program do you use for uh, downloading? Um, it's called EV3 Classroom. It uses this red logo that you can see on my screen. Um, maybe not because it's sharing, but um, the uh, color scheme for the software for Spike Prime is yellow and the color scheme for EV3 Classroom is red, but otherwise they're very similar. Uh, so let's start a new program. Using word blocks. Make it bigger. Call it Gyro Demo. And we're going to use the initial blocks that we've done before. We're going to say that. We're going to run at 30%. That we're connected to C and D, and the wheels are seven and a half centimeters. Um, and then we're going to move forward for a few centimeters. And then we're going to start moving right by changing this to a hard turn in place. And then we're going to create an event. You're too small to read. No. You see those bigger now. I'm looking for the gyro one. <laughs> Crazy. I've never used this brick. So this is for tilting, but that's not what we want. We want it for rotating. All right, I'm gonna use this more general purpose one here then. And I'm gonna to go to the sensor blocks, which we saw on the screen before, and I'm gonna get the trapezoid associated with the gyro when you first no that's and then i'm going to need a decision on that I don't know. Hmm. painting myself in a corner i'm going to have to do uh an operator so i'm going to get ahead of myself here Plug that in there. I'm going to put this in here and change it to yaw. So, when I first pull it out, it, it was set to pitch, but that's not what I wanted. So, I changed it to yaw. I wanted to go more than uh, 89 degrees, which would be about 90, before it stops turning. And then I'm going to tell it to go forward. Use this one. Okay, so let's read this program. 
when the program starts, set the movement speed to 30%, set the movement a motor to C and D, set the wheel diameter to 17 and a half, go forward for 10 centimeters, start turning right and keep turning right until the, uh, the next event occurs, which is the yaw angle is greater than 89 degrees. To be careful about this, I'm going to add one other block, um, which is go I'm going to set the yaw, yaw angle to zero before I start the turn. The reason for that is if I power up this robot and it's like that when I power it up, and then I go to set it on the on the road, it's already yawed by, by my twisting it. So when I start the program, I want to tell it that this is zero, as if I'm telling it that's north. And then when it starts turning, the yaw, yaw sensor, the gyro built into the white brick, will trigger when it gets to 90 degrees and it'll change what the program is going to do. So let me download that into program slot number one. Then I'm going to select program one. Let me stop the share. See that there. Okay. Let me see if I can show you that a little better. So that turn was controlled by the gyro. We didn't tell it how far to turn other than we said, keep turning until the gyro detects 90 degrees. So let's have some fun with that in the, our final three minutes. I'm gonna go back to share one more time. And I'm gonna change the event to 179 degrees. So just by changing that one place in the program, it should change it so it does a 180 rather than a 90 degree turn. I'm going to leave it pretty much where it is now, and it will consider going right to be zero because it's going to reset that yaw angle and press this to be zero. The next. Now that's interesting. The reason why that doesn't work is because this silly yaw angle on the spike prime, when it gets past 180, it thinks it's minus 179. Um, so we're going to have to make the program slightly different for, to get it to work. I'm going to make it 175. So it triggers before it gets to 180. Pretty sure that'll fix it. Yep. So we can control uh, the turns with the gyro pretty precisely, as long as we get used to the silly gyro math and we can touch on that some more later. Um, let me switch cameras. And take any closing questions. Tomorrow we'll get into control and we can do a lot more with sensors when I show you more about um, the control blocks. Questions for tonight? See, Chris has uh, got a team meeting tonight, so he's left. Um, 
So I'm going to stop the recording, make it a little less formal.